This week, we travel back in time to 1983. Ronald Reagan was two years into his first term. Michael Jackson's Billie Jean was playing on the radio. And Return of the Jedi was killing it on the silver screen. That's also the year Dave met Darlene, and it was love at first sight. They were inseparable. They had the marriage everyone else wished for. It really was the Dave and Darlene show. But their lives were turned upside down when Darlene canceled the show after a 37-year run. Welcome to My Crazy Divorce. I'm a failure as a husband. I'm a failure as a man. It's just, I'm beautiful and I'm bright and I deserve better. It's a great day, I'm feeling good. Oh, the possibilities of what I could. Oh, do with the world at my fingertips. My imagination brings a smile up to my lips. Welcome back to My Crazy Divorce, everyone. I'm your host, Tom Milligan. When I first started this show, my intent was to expose how stupid the current divorce process is, what with all the fighting, hearings, bickering, arguing, and one-upsmanship. It's ridiculous. I originally thought the show would focus on the divorce itself. How long did it take? How much did it cost? You know, that sort of thing. And while I think we've all heard enough by now to know that the current adversarial process is just dumb the show's focus has naturally shifted to the failed marriages and the post-divorce glow-up of our guests. Today's show falls squarely into this new focus. In fact, we don't spend much time on the actual divorce at all. Most of the interview focuses on the 90 days leading up to the day Darlene surprises Dave by telling him she was leaving after 37 years of marriage. Before we get to that story... Always remember that I'm not an attorney, so I don't give legal advice. If anything I say ever sounds like legal advice, trust me, it's pure coincidence. If you need actual legal advice, contact a licensed attorney. Now, I got to give a quick shout out to our sponsor, OurDivorce.com, for two reasons. First, they pay us to advertise here on the show. And second, because Dave and Darlene really should have used OurDivorce.com for their divorce. And Dave agrees. Unfortunately, as you're about to hear, Darlene's attorney convinced her that she could do better than what she and Dave had already agreed to. Spoiler alert, she didn't do better. And it took 10 months and tens of thousands of dollars to do much worse. Tragic. So if you're considering a divorce, Don't be like Darlene. Visit OurDivorce.com if you think you and your spouse can both be reasonable. Their simple three-step process is specifically designed to help amicably divorcing couples through the entire divorce process. And since it doesn't cost anything unless it works for you, there's literally no risk to give it a try. Again, try OurDivorce.com to save thousands on your divorce. Now, don't forget... If you'd like to share your crazy divorce story here on our show, please visit MyCrazyDivorce.com and apply to be a guest. I'd really love to hear from you. Okay, now that the housekeeping is done, let's meet Dave. Okay, Dave, so glad to have you here on the show. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me, Tom. I'm excited to get into the show today, but uh, before we do that, I got to ask just to make sure I don't butcher it, which I probably will anyway. Can you just explain how to say your last name? Well, if you pronounce it phonetically, you're going to get very close, and it's pronounced Pizzoferrato. 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 So I don't need to make it all fancy like Pizzoferrato. 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 <laughs> it's a, in fact, it's a town in uh, in southern Italy in, uh, in Abruzzi. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I have my own town. Uh, wow. that That's a first on the show. Tell us about young Dave, starting from, you know, your earliest memories all the way up through the end of high school. I am, uh, I'm one of six kids. I am five of six. My father fought in World War II. He was in, uh, he was in Bastogne. He fought in the Battle of the Bulge. Wow. And um, I learned early on that when he would frequently uh, wake at night screaming and hollering and yelling, um, no doubt. He didn't talk about the war a lot, but 
who was also one of the soldiers that they made mar march, the American soldiers made march through the, through the death camps to bear witness of uh, oh. what happened there. And I'm sure that uh, those haunted him his, his entire life. And so big, loud Italian family. My father is one of 12 kids. And uh, so I am five of six. And like I said, it's a big, loud, boisterous family. Um, my mother was, uh, she had a lot of uh, mental and emotional issues. And um, um, I could never bring any friends over to my house because I was too embarrassed of her behavior. And uh, one day I came home from school. I was in high school. I came home from school and uh, all of my belongings were in a box on the front stairs. And I went into the house. I said, what? I went into my bedroom. I said, what? And she had converted my bedroom into her sewing room. So she, she essentially put me out. So uh, that was my young life. I was on the, in high school, I was on the track team. I was on the football team. I did all the stuff that kids did in high school. And, uh, so did your family, uh, you know, there, there are Catholic families and then there are Catholic families. We were Catholic. Well, you... We weren't Catholic. We were just Catholic. Where did you grow up? I grew up in East Hartford. Actually, I was born in Hartford, and I grew up in East Hartford, Connecticut. My mother was really hard to get along with. There was a lot of yelling and fighting between the two of them. Um, nobody ever hit anybody, but there was violence. Sometimes my father would lose his temper, and I remember one time he took the living room apart, put his foot through the television. Um, and, of course, me and my twin sisters, we would huddle upstairs in the corner, scared. Uh, I'm certain that he had uh, PTSD. Um, okay, so Dave, we're going to, let's switch gears and talk about your ex. We're going to call her Darlene for this show. I want everyone to know that is not her real name. Okay. But let's let's learn about Darlene. Where did she grow up? She grew up here um, in St. John, Michigan. Um, she went to she lived on the country. She was a country kid. Uh, she went to a one room schoolhouse through, I think the third grade, her father who was deceased died tragically about 20 years ago. Um, he has his own airfield. He built his own airfield out on the, the back 40, I guess you'd call it. Wow. And, uh, a flight instructor and, uh, complete with a hangar and gas for, pilots to gas up. And uh, so my ex uh, learned to fly before she was even driving. And she soloed, I think at the age of, I could be wrong, uh, 14 or 15. Wow, that's impressive. Yeah, pretty impressive. And, uh, and other than that, it's, I think it's uh, kind of unremarkable. Her father was very stoic. Didn't have a lot to say. So her parents, did they, is her mom still around? Yes. Okay. So, so her parents stayed married until dad died. That's correct. And they had okay. a good marriage. By all accounts, they had a really great marriage. So she grew up in a household, almost the polar opposite of yours, which yep. was full of turmoil. Your parents divorced, did you say? Uh, after I, well, after I left home, yeah, they divorced. Okay. So you spent your whole childhood probably wishing they would divorce um and then then they finally did but your life was full of turmoil hers was a peaceful happy home uh-huh by all accounts yeah obviously you weren't there but based on what you've heard right and did her mom ever remarry no but she got a boyfriend and uh and they actually had a little ceremony between the two of them not an official they never married but they made a commitment to one another and that was uh um and they were together for a very long time. Larry died a couple of years ago. And, uh, and mourned his loss for a very long time. All right, Dave. So you and Darlene, um, you both grow up in a completely different states, hundreds of miles apart. Uh, 
tell us how, how these two crazy kids come together. I had moved to Colorado. I got a job working for a, uh, a tech company, manufacturing of uh, manufactured printed circuit boards. That's what I've done all my life. And, um, so I was living in what I call the animal house. <laughs> Me and a bunch of guys <laughs> were living in uh, Westminster, Colorado. Um, the kind of place where you open the refrigerator is just full of long neck buds. Ping pong <laughs> table in the back. And uh, Darlene worked at a restaurant that I would go to frequently. And she was so cute. She had a smile that would light up a room. Big, broad, beautiful smile. And uh, I would go there regularly and order the prime rib. And to this day, when somebody mentions prime rib to me, that's a trigger for me. People don't know it, but when they talk about prime rib, I'm immediately propelled back to the past. And uh, so I would always order the prime rib, and she was cute, and we'd flirt, and I'd talk. And one day I said, okay, I'm going to ask her out. And, uh, and I said, can I get your phone number? And uh, she turned... She's blonde, fair skin. She turned Macintosh apple red. <laughs> she, she just totally blushed. And she did a 180 and walked away. So I said, okay. So I headed for the door, paid my bill, headed for the door. And right when I had my hand on the door ready to leave, she was, she was right over there at my elbow. She handed me a napkin with her phone number on it. Nice. And uh, that's where it all began. What was she doing in Colorado? Um, she is one of three children. She's the youngest. And her brother and sister had moved to Colorado. And she wanted out of Michigan. So she, uh, she got on a bus. And she came to Colorado and uh, got an apartment. And... Uh, Got a job in a restaurant. <laughs> and uh, and the rest is history. There you go. The rest is history, yep. Wow. Okay, so for you, it was love at first sight, yes. pretty much. Yep. And um, that was 39 years ago? 39 years ago, correct. 39 Ish. years ago. Ish. Yeah, give or take. Yep. So, so you ask her out, she gives you her number on a napkin. Yeah. And you're thrilled. Yeah. Tell us about the courtship. Uh, well, we went out on our first date. And, uh, you know, I was never very smooth, suave, or debonair. So my first date, we went to a bar and played pool. <laughs> what do you mean you're not suave or debonair? Come on. That's totally romantic. <laughs> I, I guess. I guess. And then we, we, uh, we began seeing each other in earnest. And um, we... We were dating exclusively, mm -hmm. exclusively. And she loved me. And treated me in a way that no other woman ever had in my entire life. That was one another reason that I, I loved her so much. How, how old were you? I'm sorry to break in, but what, how old were you at this point? Let me see. Well, we got, I got married when I was 30. So, um, 29 ish, 30. Okay. Right so you, you dated, you'd had girlfriends. This isn't your first oh, row. Yeah, that's correct. I spent, uh, from 18 to 30, 12, 12 I was, I was single for 12 years mm -hmm. and I did all the stuff the single guys do. Mm -hmm. Um, I dated. And and how I, old was she? When you first got together, twenty four, twenty four ish. Yeah. Okay. But she was beautiful, blonde hair, blue eyes, apple cheeks, a smile. Like I said, a smile that would. She walked in and smiled, and she lit up a room. And uh, she was beautiful, and uh, and uh, she loved me, and I loved her, and. Um, Later, 
I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. When we got married, in retrospect, I look back, and there were all kinds of warning signs to me. Don't marry this, this woman. And uh, but I didn't. Uh, <laughs> let me find it. I have a stack of documents here, and this is this is but a, a fraction, <laughs> a fraction of. Uh, and I had to write it all down, lest I forget. Um, a list with names of her infidelities during that year. Oh, here we go. I'm going to cover her first name. So during her... Eileen's infidelities. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So this was while you were dating? Yes. Yes. And you knew about it? Yes. Let me count them for you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And one of them was my brother. <laughs> I'm sorry. Dave, we're going to have to take a minute on this here. So you're dating this woman. Uh-huh. You're in love with her. And by the way, anybody who is just listening to this, you haven't seen Dave's face. But you can just see the pain and the emotion in this guy. And by the way, also the 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 love when he talks about her glowing, you know, the rat apple cheeks and everything. He truly was in love with this woman. And I hate to say it this way, he you still are. Um and that's it's you know, that's both beautiful and sad at the same time. So my question though is so you're dating exclusively but she's sleeping with six different guys that you know of. Oh, girls too. <laughs> okay, this is getting better or worse. So she's sleeping with all these different people, including your brother, and yet you still married her. What's what's going on there other than was what is it? I I just forgave her. Over and over and over again. Did she did she admit these to you, or did you catch her? When I was living in Animal House, she was at Animal House one day, and I left. And when I came back, there was a, a guy there, and uh, she didn't expect me to walk in. But when I walked in, she was sitting on his lap, and they were making out. So is that an infidelity? I call it an infidelity. Sure. You bet. And then there's another guy that she went to high school with that uh, this was at the time we only had one computer and I was on the computer and I saw the dialogues going on back and forth between them. And uh, that was when we were in Colorado. This guy was in Michigan. But there was a lot of, oh, had we only met sooner and da 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 da, da. Had we had gotten together? A lot of that kind of talk. Mm-hmm. Um, so an emotional connection, if not yeah. physical. Uh-huh. Uh, carrying on a romantic relationship online, I caught you. You admitted it we, while we were married. My brother Richard, you fucked my brother Richard in California while we were dating. And then let's talk about the man that she worked for at a bakery, an Italian man when she was in college. This doesn't count, doesn't count. But the reason I mention it, and it will be mentioned in my book, was because this set the stage. Uh, this man owned a bakery, very well-known bakery here, an Italian bakery. And uh, she had a long adulterous affair with him while she was in college, married man. And, and, and the married man's wife worked at the bakery also. So not relevant to our marriage, but it speaks of a pattern of infidelity that would play out over and over during the course of our marriage and before. Did you know you can get divorced without hiring an attorney? Let OurDivorce.com guide you through our three-step process for a simple flat fee. Visit OurDivorce.com to learn more and get started today. So you're you're clearly in love with this woman to the point where you're willing to... I, I mean, you and I talked a few weeks ago when we first met. I, I When my now ex-wife cheated on me, I chose to forgive her, but it was only one affair that I'm aware of. The, your capacity for forgiveness, well, is at least 600 times more than mine. 
um, or 600 percent higher than mine, uh, and we'll probably probably a lot more. But so, all right. So you're you're dating. How long did you date before you got seven months, four months? I I, I really don't know. Yeah. Okay. So a few months into your quote exclusive relationship. Yes. It was exclusive on your part, at least. Yes. Um, you you ask her to marry you. Yeah. Uh, again, sorry to be so blunt, knowing that she's a cheater. Yeah. And you ask her to marry you. Yeah. And she says yes. Yeah. And so you now you're engaged for a few months. And then a few months later, you get married. Was it a big wedding, small wedding? Tell it's us about the wedding. wedding. It was a small wedding in Aurora, Colorado, the same church where John Denver had his memorial service. Oh. Um, the Faith Lutheran something. Okay. <laughs> really important part of the story, apparently. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So congratulations. You're married, and you're married to this woman who you clearly love. And you say that she loved you. Uh, and I don't doubt that. But clearly there was a difference in loyalty, your definition. Me. She adored me. Okay. What do you mean by that? She would bring her friends by. Uh, who, at one point, we were both working in a shopping mall. And she worked a few doors down selling. She was the manager of a shoe store. So she would bring her friends over to show me off. Hmm. This is my man. That's right. So you say she adored you. Yes. Um, I, I, again, pe- people who adore each other generally keep their promises. And I'm, I'm not questioning so much as uh, trying to understand how you justify or how you reconcile that in your mind when you say she loved me, she adored me, and then she slept with all of these different people. So they weren't all, you- they, they weren't all sex. Well, having been the victim of both a sexual affair and an emotional affair from the yeah. same woman, I will tell you the emotional one hurt a thousand times worse Absolutely. than the sexual one. Yep. So whether she cheated physically or se- or emotionally, she was cheating. Yep. Uh, Darlene was. And so I'm just trying to understand how do you, how do you justify or rec- rationalize that in your head that she loved you, but she did these things that clearly hurt you? She liked sex. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Okay, so you're married. You're you're happy, presumably, mm-hmm. that you're married. Uh, yeah. Tell us. I always say that there's kind of this arc of a marriage, right? There's you, you start out, you get married, you walk out, people are chucking rice at you or whatever's happening at the wedding, right? And you you know, go on a honeymoon or not, whatever, but you move, you, you, you settle into married life. Tell us about your married life. Let's talk about the first, I don't know, 10, 20 years, whatever. Just kind of tell us about that early life before you, before things went bad. It was good. It was a good marriage. We were both happy. I was Mm -hmm. apparently in retrospect later on, she said she wasn't. I said, really? I said, I, I said, I, I recall our marriage, it was after she left me, I recall our marriage being filled with mostly love, laughter, joy. And she says, well, that's not how I recall. I said, really? She goes, yeah. I, I would say 50% of the time I was unhappy. 50% of the time I didn't like you. I said, so let me see. We've been married for 37 years. So for 37 years, every other day, you didn't like me. See how it doesn't compute? Well, it wasn't all, it wasn't one day on, one day off, one day on, one day off. And then she started telling me that um, you were just a lousy husband. And I went, <laughs> what? What? This is all part of the narrative that she's has to spin mm-hmm. to fabricate in order for her to justify what she did. So rashly and impulsively like that, the whole world, her whole family and circle of friends had to, what, what? They had to be Mm -hmm. scratching their head. So 
The only way that she was able, that my opinion, the only way she's able to do that was she had to rewrite history and she had to spin a narrative that yeah. made that made her the victim. Of course, that's that's uh, that that is like uh, that is like step one of the playbook. Yes, it is. Yeah, is 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 play the victim yep. and uh, place blame elsewhere. During that first 20, 30 years of your marriage, what was there? Were there uh, other partners? The emotional affair with this guy uh, after we were married, uh, the sexual and emotional affair with this guy, who she's with now, uh, the sexual affair that she had with this guy um, was an employee of hers. You admitted that he kissed you and you admitted to me that he was feeling you up. One or two years into our marriage, he was an employee of yours at the shoe store. Um, so yeah, there was there was there was two or three um, after we were after we were married. Oh, not to mention uh, the gay woman that ran the musical instrument uh, department in the back of the music store. Let's talk about your family for just a minute. Did you guys have kids together? One daughter. She lives far away. She's married. I've got two grandchildren. She has two children. She's married to a great guy. And I love my daughter to pieces. You're back in Michigan. So you're, you're, so Darlene hated Michigan enough to get on a bus and, um, head to Colorado, uh, head to Colorado. Uh, um, but now you, you moved back to Michigan. Let's talk about how that happened. Okay, Darlene's father was a flight instructor. And as I mentioned, he had his own runway. Anyways, there was a storm about 22 years ago. And uh, her father, he was an engineer's engineer. He was an outdoorsman. And there was a storm. There was big downbursts and knocked a tree down across, not across the runway, but across the side of the runway. Uh, he was out there trying to take the tree apart and uh, safety helmet, the whole nine yards. He was Mr. Safety, but accidents happen. Mm -hmm. Tree sprung up, hit him in the head, killed him instantly. So, uh, and my wife's mother discovered him out on the runway. She went out looking for him because he hadn't been back. So anyways, there it was. Her father dies tragically. Now her mother's out here in the house by herself with an airport and uh, an 80 acre farm. Um, she, she didn't do any farming, she leased it. That's what a lot of folks do, they lease it to farmers. So now she's out there alone and my wife says, you know, we need to move to Michigan to be with my mother, to help her out. And uh, uh, my employer at the time was in uh, Singapore. So I was making trips to Detroit uh, every two weeks from Denver to Detroit to go visit uh, one of our biggest customers. And my employer said, oh, man, you should move there. You mm. well, close, close to, our, to our biggest customer. Okay, my employer wanted me to. My wife wanted me to. I didn't want to. I thought about it, and I relented. So we came out here to be with her mom and to help take care of her mom and to be emotional support for her. So during that time, so my mother-in-law lives here and she also has another house right over here, literally uh, right around the, the dirt road, right around the corner. This is the house that my mother-in-law grew up in. And my mother-in-law was, of course, she was living here. So she would rent this place to renters mm -hmm. as a source of income. Um, so my mother-in-law decided that she was going to parcel off a piece of land around that, called it the old farmhouse, and gift it to my wife, which she did. And uh, so I thought that was awesome. So then uh, my wife went and changed her will to include the farm. And 
Uh, and in her will, she said, in the event of her death, that the farm goes to our daughter. And, and then she deeded the house with just her. And I said, what about me? Well, I don't want you on that. If, if, I, if I die, you'll go and sell the farmhouse. And it's been in our family over 100 years. And I, don't, I, said, I, I said, how many times have we talked about the day that you retire? Because I'm already retired. That uh, we sell this house and we go live in the farmhouse. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't sell the place. I know it's it's got your family history there. So, so she was just adamant about it. And I said, okay, so wait a minute. Let me understand this. All of our life, everything that we owned, we didn't have separate bank accounts. We had a, a bucket. Everything went into the bucket. Everything was ours. The homes that we've owned, the money that we have, the retirement funds that we have. So now what you're telling me is there is ours. Oh, and then there's yours. So there's ours and then there's yours. Let, let's um, let's take a step. I just want to understand when was this happening? When, when did the farmhouse get deeded? And the farmhouse got deeded to her. I'm going to guess and say four years ago. Oh, so this so so your father in law died like 20 years ago. That's correct. But then, and you moved to Michigan just four or five years ago, or no, moved to Michigan 22 years ago this summer. Okay. So and, but after, it was just four or five years ago that mother-in-law says, I want to give you this house. That's right. Okay. After all you've done for me and I really appreciate it, I want to show my appreciation to you. Okay. So not that long ago. That's right. Interesting. Okay. Yep. There's been infidelity leaving, leading up to this yep. point. So it has not been a perfect marriage, but it's been a presumably somewhat happy marriage along the way. Who has a perfect marriage? Show me that. Show me that. Exactly. Well, a perfect marriage has bumps along the way. Yeah. There, there is nothing. I mean, if you had no bumps, it wouldn't be a perfect marriage. Interesting. We were right. happy. We spent time together. We laughed. We laughed. That was the, in fact, we called it the, the Dave and Darlene show when we were with folks and friends. Um, everybody was blown away. What? You, what? Yeah, you're, you're divorcing Dave. You guys get along so good, and we did. We did. We really, really did. Yeah. Well, so all right. So the farmhouse thing comes along. Yeah. They, that's a pretty big. I mean, you know, a lot slap of couples, in the face. Yeah, it's a slap in the face because you know a lot of couples keep their finances separate. So yep. that wouldn't be a big deal for them. But when you've right. been married for 34 years or 33 years or whatever at that point, yep. there's never been anything separate. And now all of a sudden there is, that that's is right. a red flag. Yep. I, I can totally see why that's, that's concerning. So, all right, well, let's pick up the story. Where, where do we go from here? She takes over the house and she's making improvements to it along with me. I spent a lot of time over there helping her do this, that, and the other thing. I put my I put our own joint money into various improvements into the farmhouse. The couple that was living there, they left, and then this guy, Scott, that's his real name. I have no problem with that. Okay. He's a friend of ours. We've known him for 12 years. He's living in Florida. He finds out that the farmhouse is available. He said, Ooh, can I come up and rent the farmhouse? And Darlene said, sure, come on up. And, uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail about him other than to tell you that at a certain point in time afterwards, I hired a private investigator to look into him. Okay. And everything that I, everything that I knew and also things that I suspected was absolutely true. Okay. He's never had a real job in his whole life. He's a grifter. And he performed the ultimate grift on my wife. He groomed her for a year and a half. So he's living in this, in the farmhouse. Paying rent, presumably. Paying rent. Um, and of course, she's spending a lot of time over there. And he would have these full moon events outside. 
And then there's people milling in and out of the house and sitting around picnic tables and eating food, and, uh, you know, enjoying each other's company. Everybody would bring a plate. I, I know what time they, they wrap up. And uh, she wouldn't come home until, you know, midnight. Mm. And uh, they generally wrap up at around nine. And you can do latest. a lot in three hours. That's right. So she's developing this relationship with him, unbeknownst to me. And it wasn't until she left me on July 24th of 2021, sitting in this very seat. She was right there. And I'm looking at her like this. And she says, I believe in you. I said, what? Why? We've grown apart. Mm. So I was mad. I, now, I'm mad. And uh, so I said, okay, then. If you're going to leave, then leave. And then I said, no, wait. <laughs> <laughs> no, wait. Don't leave. I went upstairs to get some clothes on. And I came downstairs. She was busy writing this letter to me. Can I read you some of it? Yes. I'd, I'd love for you to read as much as you want. <laughs> there are more things I have to say, but no, you can't listen to me now. I talked to Scott about it today because I needed to know if I could go there. Now, I highlighted that in yellow. That was a bold-faced lie. Mm -hmm. She talked to Scott today because she needed to know if she could go there. Mm -hmm. You had this all planned. Well, in advance. You sure. didn't talk to him. You didn't call him and talk to him today to ask him if she could go there. I don't know what's next. I just know that I cannot spend another winter sitting on the sofa watching TV with my nose in my phone. I won't survive it. So apparently I'm responsible for her sitting on the sofa watching TV with her nose in her phone. My next conversation is with our daughter and then my mom. I may end up with her, her mom. She may end up living with her mom. That's a lie. Right. Flat out, flat out lie. I've got 90 pages of text messages here. This is not just my word against hers. The flat out lie. Yeah. Um, I'm not ready to give up on my life. And if we keep doing the same old things, I have a hard time reading or writing, um, expecting different results. Well, that's what's going to happen. I know how hard this is for you. And it may end up being a big mistake. But I have to do it. It may end up being a big mistake, but I have to do it. Hey guys, this is Jill from OurDivorce.com. Pretty much everyone has either been through a crazy divorce or knows somebody else who has. When Tom and I designed OurDivorce.com, we knew it wouldn't work for everyone. We knew that there would still be people out there who'd rather pay their attorney to send an email to their soon-to-be ex's attorney threatening to go to court over the blunder. We didn't build OurDivorce.com for those people. We designed OurDivorce.com for divorcing couples who are willing to compromise and who, instead of spending money on an attorney, would rather just get it done while using Our Divorce's quick, easy, and intuitive process. So you have a couple of choices if you're thinking of divorce. You can choose to spend thousands of dollars hoping you win in court after years of fighting. Or you can go to OurDivorce.com, follow our three-step process at your own pace, then print, sign, and file with the courts, all for just $299. Seems like a no-brainer to me. So visit OurDivorce.com and click Get Started to access the most effective, easy-to-use, and comprehensive online divorce solution available today. July 24th, basically 10 and a half months ago, you're sitting in literally the same spot. You're sitting right now. Right now. Your wife of 38 years. 37 and a half at the time. Okay. 37 and a half years who 
you clearly love and adore. Uh, and I was been, committed to. Yeah. We made uh, a vow. Right. But she walks right up and says, I'm out. Yeah. And then you leave for a couple of minutes, come back, and she's written you that letter. Yep. Wow. Yep. Okay. I still don't know why. I still don't know. Nothing that she said made sense. We've grown apart, really. I said, what about marriage counseling? You want to go to marriage counseling? Nope. I asked her, I begged her dozens of times. Well, it wasn't so until, and it wasn't until I'm still trying to figure out what happened. What the hell happened? It hit me like a freight train. And I want to talk about signs for a minute because I, I can't tell you on TikTok how many times, not that many, but more than once or twice, people say, well, there must have been signs. Right. I was about to ask because people are going to say, come on, Dave, there had to be some signs. Did you just choose to ignore them? But let's let's get it out there. Yeah. So here's what I have to say about signs. When you're in a, in a relationship as important as marriage, a relationship where you both made vows to stay with each other through thick and thin, better or worse, sickness and health, rich or poor, we vowed before the whole world. Mm -hmm. When you're in a relationship that important and Arguably, it's the most important relationship in your life. You owe it to one another to use your words mm -hmm. as opposed to trying to give you signals. Signals that could be totally missed or misinterpreted. Uh, if you want to end a marriage, you don't do it based on signals and signs. Right. What you do... What adults do is they say, look, uh, family meeting, uh, we need to talk and then start talking. And then a dialogue ensues back and forth and back and forth. That didn't happen. So don't talk to me about science because if she was going to leave, Don't communicate it with signs. Be up front. Give us a chance. 37 and a half years. Mm -hmm. And as far as I know, our marriage is sound. A little over a year ago, we did a Facebook Live. And I'm so glad I did. It was her and I walking around town for an hour doing a Facebook Live. You know how live events work. People pop in, people pop out. And they talk to you and you talk to them. And it's basically a, a, an interaction, a snapshot in time, if you will, of what our relationship, what our marriage was like. Mm -hmm. I challenge anybody to go look at that. And tell me if you see a marriage in trouble. You don't. In fact, there was one part that I grabbed out this perfect example of her and I, the Dave and Darlene show. We were just, we were jokesters. We knew how to have fun. We could make people laugh and we made each other laugh. She was cracking up. She goes, she goes that right there, honey. That's one of the reasons that I love you so much. And just a few months later, God, you can understand my surprise. Yeah. So, I'm going to give you some snippets. Now, in that 90 pages of text messages, I extracted some of the more important ones. So these are text messages between Darlene and Scott. That's right. Over what period of time? About two months. Okay. okay. So this is pretty much leading up to July 24th. Correct. He says to her, Okay, so this was March. March is coming in like a penis. I'm sorry, what does that mean? I, I don't know. I, the weather, March is coming in like a lion, going out like a lamb, I guess. He said, March is coming in like a penis. Talking to my wife. 
about March is coming in like a thief. Then my wife said, uh, excellent. David doesn't know that I bought those meds from frontline doctors. So that's just between you and me. So she bought some ivermectin, I think, uh -huh. online, frontline doctor. Uh, Scott's a tinfoil hat wearing Looney Tune. Okay. So this is the COVID is fixed with ivermectin. Yes. He, okay. he, he, he believed initially that uh, COVID was caused in Wuhan right after they got their 5G towers in there. 5G cell phones are giving people coronavirus. This is, I'm serious. I could give you does he, that. does he, do you believe that he actually believes that? Oh, yes. Oh, really? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Um, Scott says, want a foot rub? My hands are looking for volunteer feet. Then he says, your heart is mending. I will do a process. He, you need to understand, he, he fancies himself a spiritual healer, guru, uh, massage therapist. He does. Your heart is mending. I will do a process with you on your return for physical therapy to clarify what to communicate to your daughter. If you are open to it, open to it, I will play her role, but I can't play baby. He, he called me baby. So he's coaching. He's coaching her, offering, offering her advice uh, to do some role playing on how to tell our daughter that she's leaving. Here, 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 Darlene, let me help you practice on how you should say and what you should say to your daughter. What and we, can role, we can role play. So he's, he's helping her out. Now, if this man were a friend of mine, he should be saying, I hear you, but you need to be talking to Dave about this. You guys need to be communicating about this. But mm -hmm. no, he didn't support me at all. In fact, just the opposite. He encouraged her. He encouraged her. You just said something that I had forgotten um, about when Trinity left um, with with her I call him Steve is um, how I refer to him. And he and I were friends. We worked together. We had known each other for a while and we'd worked on many projects together. We went to trade shows together. I mean, this, this is a work friend. Uh, now he did live 1800 miles away. So it's not like we hung out on the weekends, but we were friends at work. And when the two of them connected to begin this emotional affair. And I called them both out. I said, guys, this is, you've, you've gone past appropriate. And he actually literally called me up and told me that he was rooting for me. And I said, rooting for me? What does that even mean? I didn't know I needed rooting. <laughs> and... Great of me to laugh. <laughs> no, I'm with you. I said, what, what are you talking about? And he said, well, she's confided in me that she's, she's not that happy. And so I'm trying to coach her to help her talk to you and get through it. And I didn't, the, uh, fortunately, I was not stupid enough to believe that. During uh, his I, deceit and treachery, he was trying to put on an air as a hero. Exactly. Yeah. And it was just a couple of months later that she's going, by the way, I need space to think, which was really space to plan my exit, yeah. which she did a month later. So I hear, hear um, Scott calling, you know, telling, like you say, he should have been saying, talk to Dave, fix this. And that's what Steve should have been saying to Trinity. But anyway, I not that just really hit me the way you he, said that. He was doing the opposite. Exactly. And I'm uh, sure that my Steve was doing that same thing. I just don't have a front row seat to it. Scott says, I forgot the nickname I gave the tyrant of Meat Street yesterday when we were leaving rehab. So now he's calling me the tyrant of Meat Street. Then he says, carry my heart. I carry your heart. And then she responds, I have it. I have his it. heart. His heart. 
Then he says, I had a magical morning with Orange Dawn. Whatever the hell that means. Right. Scott says, I miss you. She says, oh, I'm missing you too. I find myself more and more planning my exodus. It's frightening and exciting. Then he she says, said those words, planning yeah. my exit? Yes. Yep. Oh. Her exodus. Oh, exodus. Same thing. Yeah, it is. Then he says, you can rent the upstairs as long as I have visiting privileges. Now, he had a mild stroke. I need to preface what I'm going to tell you here before I read you this. He had a mild stroke in, uh, in June. And while he was in the hospital, my wife was there tending to him every day. And so then they released him. And he has to do physical therapy. And my wife learned from therapist at the hospital the exercises that he need to, needed to do. So she was going to help him. And by the way, I thought all this was great. Yeah, because you don't know any of the stuff that you're reading. Uh, 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 nope. I thought it was great that she's being so kind and helping mm-hmm. this guy because he has no family around here. None. He's on his own. He's by himself. So he says, my backstroke is improving. My breaststroke is, imper- is perfect in slow motion. So he's making reference to exercises that he has to do. My breaststroke is perfect in slow motion. Let that build an image in your brain. It doesn't take a, a movie producer to see that, to envision that. Uh, but your help is requested. Work on stretching my wings from behind and turn me on. Isn't love wonderful? Wow. Then she responds, I will definitely turn you on to my chiropractor. Now you need to see, it's like, I, and, and she, you know, I will definitely turn you on, space, uh, no paragraph, to my chiropractor. It's all sexual innuendo here. Sure. It's flirtatious at, 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 at the very least. This is doesn't inappropriate like, flirtation. Doesn't sound like you need too much assistance with your breaststroke, but you know, practice makes perfect. <laughs> oh, cool. Then he says... I'm getting a res, R-E-S, new paragraph, capital letters, erection. He's saying he's like, I'm getting a resurrection. I'm getting a res, erection, or rather my stroke is coming back. Same thing. You're awesome, magnificent, extraordinary, but you're married to a bad dog. Wow. So how, by the way, how old is Scott? Same age as me. So six or seven years older than she is. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. And you're 68. Uh huh. Which, by the way, you don't look 68. So kudos to you. Thank you. Uh, so Thank you she's much. she's 64, 65, whatever. 62. She's 62. Mm-hmm. And she's got the hots for this 68 year old grifter who's never had a job. That's correct. He's had, you know, a little. Yeah, Aside, odd jobs. I mean, I, I, I came to know him over time, and, and I know that his Social Security compensation is practically zero. And he gets uh, a pension from the Coast Guard. He was in the Coast Guard. And, uh, and he's made his living, you know, doing massages and never had a real job. In fact, one time he, was, he, he needed money. He, he used to come over and collect our returnable cans so that he could take them over to the grocery store and have make an extra eight bucks. He went over to the local car dealership and asking if he could be uh, <clears throat> applied for a job as a courtesy driver. And, uh, of course, they said no. Why? Because they look at his resume and there's nothing on it. Scott says, when BD isn't looking, they took to calling me BD. Bad dog. Bad dog. Okay. BD. So they abbreviated it to BD. And one time I asked my wife, after I told her, as soon as I found the text messages, I told her immediately that I found them. And then I read them. And I said, what does BD stand for? And she goes, it stands for beautiful dreamer. <laughs> now, you know, you know what you wrote here? You guys were calling me bad dog and you began to abbreviate it to BD. 
Um, uh, Scott says, when BD isn't looking, uh-uh, um, I see you kissing me passionately in front of the fire under an orange moon. I'm not sure I'm ready, LOL. Better hurry. That moon, time and tide, way for no one. She says, this has a timer? Oh, the pressure. Then she says, you're a true romantic. Wow. She wrote this thing on her Facebook wall. Here, here's, here's his romantic. Life was never meant to be a struggle. Only a leisurely walk through a flowery meadow adorned with butterflies and birds. That's his hey, problem. He wrote that? Yeah. Publicly. Well. Wow. Publicly. Yeah, on, her, that's... on her Facebook page. <laughs> um, kind of makes you sick. Oh, it makes me want to puke. Wait, Scott. Meanwhile, I'm feeding on the delicious tensions between us, and to which my wife replies, me too. Ugh. Now, this is the day that she's leaving me, 724. Oh, my God. I had a long conversation with our friend who's now living in New York. I'm not going to out her. Mm -hmm. She is so helpful and insightful. I am ready. I just need BD to come out of his cocoon upstairs and join the world. Um, then she says, I've been napping. BD hasn't been seen, except he seems to be stirring. And he says, here's, here's his advice to her. Remember, begin with your own authenticity about your inauthenticities. The human context or condition is very real for all of us, and it will break the hold he has on you. I'm holding space for you in the flat black hammock. I'm going to ask you to read that first sentence again. I'm still it, reading it. Won't, it, won't, it, won't, it, won't, it won't click with you. He's, okay. He's, it, it won't. I, I've read it a hundred times. Remember, okay. begin with your own authenticity about your inauthenticities, dot, dot, dot. That human context or condition is very real to all of us, and it will break the hold it has had on you. I'm holding space for you in the flat black hammock. I can read you some more mumbo jumbo, and I will. But this isn't really about him. But but the, the only reason I'm telling you is to paint a picture of what this what this grifter is like. I'm, it's words, I'm, it's I'm, where it's meaningless, I'm speechless. It's meaningless word salad. Oh, I'll read you something here that'll leave you more speechless. Um, she says, "Ha ha, unbelievable! He just went back upstairs." And this is where he's giving her advice on how to leave. You ready for this? Mm -hmm. You sugar or rat poison. You can do it by text, priority mail. Have our friend in New York do it, like junior high method. There must be 50 ways to leave your lover. I'm just going to read that again. Use sugar or rat poison. I mean, there is no way to interpret that other than kill him. That's right. And use your friend in New York, this one that Darlene had supposedly spoken to that morning. That's right. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. I'm packing up. He asked me to leave. He's still trying to talk me out of it. And he says, leave. Bring a minimum and negotiate for a reasonable time to transition. You need a stress reality check. And this event scores near 100, right up there with loss of a loved one. That's your house. You're not abandoning the house. You're removing yourself from a toxic relationship, a person that doesn't respect you as an equal. Now, where did he get all this stuff? Obviously. Well, yeah. He either made it up to groom her or she was telling him something. Yep. And he was throwing wood on the fire. Yep. Uh, so bring him in. And, and, and that's what she, exactly what she did. She brought him in. Him, and then uh, every week or 10 days, she'd say, I need to come over and get this. I need to come over and get that. I need to come over and get this. And she did. And I accommodated her. I laid down like uh, a rug, like a carpet. I let her walk on it. I knew she was coming. I'd have coffee ready for her. I'd buy have flowers for her. I had poetry that I would read to her. Um, the list goes on and on and on and on and on and on. I told her, I said, look, I'm willing to, I'm willing to forgive everything. I'm willing to forgive and forget everything. And then let's just, you and I concentrate on us. I, I promise we'll never look back. We'll only look, move forward. And her response was, I don't need your forgiveness and I don't want your forgiveness. Oh, my gosh. And I said, do you have any remorse at all? And she looked me square in the eye. She said, no. I, 
Dave, let me let me just again. Sometimes I, we lose track of the time ring. You're reading us text at this point from literally real time. This was yes. happening on the 24th. On the 24th. So you're upstairs changing clothes. She's texting with Scott. I'm thinking she's downstairs. She said, I need to go downstairs and get some clothes. She's texting with Scott saying, he's packing up. He asked me to leave. He's still trying to talk me out of it. That happened real time in the basement. I, I guess I don't quite understand the minimum part. What, what was the strategy of getting little well, because she couldn't load up her car with absolutely everything that she wanted to take. So, oh, so he was work. basically saying, take what you need and then come back for small loads. It, it wasn't okay. meant to torture you, at least not that you know of. Not that I know of. Uh, oh, I need. I left my shoes there. Can I come back and get my shoes? Sure. Oh, uh, uh, she's a dog trainer. Oh, I left my dog training stuff there and I need to come by and pick that up. Um, I said, okay, you know. So every time she would have a request and it got, it got to the point where I said, this has to stop. It's torture to me. You can't come over every week to 10 days. I can't tolerate it any longer. Um, I said, I want you to arrange to get all of your stuff out all at once. Let's just get this over with. If you're leaving, you're leaving, then just get it out. And her response to me was, I will not be rushed. It's just shocking. That someone can go from a loving relationship or at least presumably a loving relationship from one day Make to no literally mistake. the next. Make no mistake, it was a loving relationship. Well, I mean like July 23rd, there was, it seems like a loving relationship. Before she left me, I would say a week before she left me, I crawled into bed with her. and. And we had sex. Later, it occurred to me, and I asked her, I said, are you going to tell Scott that you cheated on him with your husband? <laughs> oh, no. And it that was the day. last time, I presume. Oh, yeah, it was the last time. Although one day she was here, because I'm a jokester. She was uh, packing up some stuff. We were upstairs. And uh, then there's a bed up there. And uh, I said, look, there's a bed. Want to do it one more time? <laughs> We're still married. <laughs> and he paused. Oh, really? There was a little, there was a little hesitation. She'll deny it, but um, she paused. And she kind of, you know, you know when somebody's thinking about something, they pause and they kind of look away like that, look up and to the left or up and to the right. She gave, she gave me one of those. And they oh. said, no. Oh, interesting. At one point, Scott said to me, after Scott knew that I had been reading the text messages, he had the, the audacity to say this. Your behavior to me has wandered deep into the realm of indecency. And now I never replied to him, but I wrote what I would reply. And I said, indecency? What do you know of indecency or decency? You know nothing. If you did, you would not have pursued a romantic and sexual relationship with another man's wife. It is you who are conflating. It is you who are indecent. What you have said is a classic example of projection. You're a grifter, plain and simple. I never said that. never before. sent it. Nope. Here's something. That, let, let me, let me, he said hey, this by the way, man, Scott, if you're listening, that, that's the response you deserved. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> Here, he sent this to me on July 25th, day after. The day after she left. I'm only going to read this to you once, so don't ask me to read it nine times because it won't make any sense to you. Okay. Not on the ninth time either. Please don't think you can, oh, please don't eat the daisies. And please don't think you can go through life controlling others through manipulation and see that behavior as healthy. You're sick to spy on Dawn and others with your energy and dot, 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 slash, slash, slash. Please don't identify with crowning yourself the victim, therefore casting others as spear chuckers in your opera. I hugged Dawn. Care for her. You didn't. That's all I did to express affection, which I find healthy and healing. I didn't cross the Rubicon. If you think that's cheating, then you're delusional. You're the bully and the abuser. 
you're the wounded one who put yourself on the trash heap and going for broke with this end game strategy with no end in sight. You blew it. And then he writes, you period blue period it. You blew it. Wow. Yeah. Wait, wait. This is the best one. He sent this email to my wife and copied me. And the reason he copied me is because I don't know. I, I, he's just technically illiterate. He, he really is. Please forward to Davey with my sincerest wishes for him to become an adult instead of a sniffling ball of ailments who worships the volcano god of pain. <laughs> what? The volcano god of pain. Yeah. Uh, I just want you to know that's the title of this episode. The volcano god of pain. I love it. <laughs> Perfect. God of pain. <laughs> and then in his email to me, he quotes the definition of responsibility. And it's on all capital letters. And do you know who Werner Earhart is? He is the original founder of EST, EST, which then it's a more cult. Than, it's a cult. Absolutely, it is. And he is a cult leader. He was a horrible, horrible man. It wasn't until his daughters became of age. You can look it up, Werner Earhart's daughters, and read about what this man was about. The only reason I'm telling you that is because he loves to quote Werner Earhart about the definition of responsibility. Oh, great. Yeah. So he keeps throwing that in my face. July 29th, I wrote to my wife, I've been thinking about nothing but you since you left. And I've been exploring my many shortcomings and how they must have made you feel. And I'm sorry every time for every time I've hurt you. As one example, when I give you the cold shoulder and shut down and become nonverbal for a day or two. So I want to tell you that I resolved to never do that again. Instead, work hard to better facilitate healthy communication with you and to always treat you with the respect and love that you deserve. This I promise. This is this is me groveling. Yeah. This is me groveling willing to say anything to get her to come back. I'm heartbroken for both of us. I can't eat. I can't sleep. I know you said you don't know if this will be forever or not. So I want to tell you that I support your journey, whatever, wherever that ultimately takes you. Please tell me what I can do to help you along your path of discovery from the bottom of my heart and soul. I hope it takes you back to me. The thought of spending the rest of my life without you is unbearable. And that's it. But here's 90 pages of text messages between her and the grifter. You and I were speaking right before we started recording about how everybody has their own experience, but there's a lot of overlap. Um, we all just have different flavors. Yep. And because I knew Steve, the guy that my ex-wife ultimately left me for, uh, he and I had literally a face-to-face -face conversation um, while they were in the midst of this emotional affair. And I had written a list of things I wanted to make sure I talked about. Um, I didn't want to miss anything. And so I, um, I had my list with me and we sat down at this restaurant and I was going through my list. And this son of a bitch looks across the table at me and says now i understand why trinity says what she says because if you truly if this were truly heartfelt you wouldn't need to write it down and i looked right at him and i go first off that's the dumbest thing i've ever heard and secondly how and i'm now stupider you? for having heard it <laughs> Yes, exactly. Uh, how dare you try to tell me what is heartfelt and what isn't? I mean, you don't even know what you're talking about. You, like you just said, you chased another man's wife, purposely chased another man's wife. Yep. And that's, you know, you don't, you don't get to talk. And I, I thought of that for two reasons. Number one, because of the, the message that uh, Scott sent to you. 
But secondly, I'm watching you read that. And I could say, hey, Dave, if you truly felt that way, you wouldn't have to read it. That's bullshit. I, I can see it in your eyes. I can hear it in your voice. You, the love that you felt and the betrayal is, it, it's, it's, it's thick. I can feel it. Well, here it is, a little over 10 months later, I'm divorced. And I told her, if we're gonna get divorced, let's not shovel bucket loads of money out into the driveway and light it on fire. We can get divorced ourselves. Because I've been around the block and I had nothing, I'm retired. I've had nothing to do for the first three months than to study and learn and study study and learn and study and learn. And I said, we could get divorced for about 500 bucks. Oh, we can't do that. We have to have lawyers. I said, no, we don't. We don't have to have lawyers. People do it all the time. In fact, we even wrote an agreement for the division of assets. I said, really, that's what divorce is about. Mm -hmm. It's about who gets what. And it's not about things. I don't give a shit about things. You can take whatever out of this house that you want. At this point, it's about money. It's about mm -hmm. equity in the house. So her and I negotiated in writing the division of assets. And by the way, it was a lot more generous there. She should have taken that deal yeah. because what she ended up with wasn't as good. Mm -hmm. Coupled with the fact that I stopped counting after $12,000 to my attorney. So we had an agreement. And then she said, okay, I'm going to write it by my attorney. And then she came back to me and she said, okay, I talked to, uh, I talked to uh, my attorney. And she said, wow, you guys are doing really good. Uh, now, this is a voice message she left. You guys are doing really good. Um, but there's just a few more things we need to talk about. Uh-oh. Mm -hmm. There's just a few more things we need to talk about. So then I call her and she say, okay, well, I want this, that, and the other thing. Um, I want you to give me half of your social security check. So she basically said, you can do a lot better. Yeah. You can take him for more. That's right. And that's when I said, not happening. I said, listen, the things that you're asking for are outrageous. This is why we should have just settled between the two of us. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you right now, not only will I not agree to these additional stipulations that you have, I will spend every penny of my retirement funds and equity in this home to fight you and expose you for the lying, cheating, treacherous human that you are. So you want to do that in court and it'll become public record. Well, I've got things against you too. And I said, listen, you've already taken everything of value to me. You've got nothing. Go ahead. Bring it on. Give it your best shot. Yeah. Give it your best shot because I've already lost everything of value to me. My family. You can't hurt me anymore. But I told her that I was going to take her all the way to court. And I believe that only helped me when we sat down in mediation. At artdivorce.com, I see it all the time. We've got one party, in this case, Dave, willing to negotiate, willing to compromise, willing to be generous, willing to forego the pride. And then the other party, in this case, Darlene, who says, oh, no, that's not enough. I'm going to take you for more. Yeah. And I don't want to say inevitably, but in so many cases, it turns out that they didn't get as much as the original offer. And, and by the way, they spent a year of their life and untold thousands of dollars to get to the point where they lost, they lost ground. That's exactly right. Um, and it's, it's, it's tragic because you know, you, you're not in a position where you're trying to save for your kid's college education or something. You're past that. But so many couples, they're trying to take care of their children. They're trying to help their kids through college. They're trying to do, they're trying to get to that point where they can retire debt-free. And instead, 
they're allowing their attorneys to retire debt free. And that's tragic to me. And I'm not saying that just because I own artdivorce.com. I'm saying that because it's a tragedy. So Dave, it's um you're divorced. You you went through what is absolutely a heart-wrenching, horrible, ugly betrayal and divorce or a, a horrible situation. So what what's next? Well, I've been looking at that for a long time and there's I've got several choices. One, I could just stay here in the house. That's the path of least resistance. Or some ideas I've got around, haven't really decided on anything yet. You know, I worked for a company in Thailand, in Bangkok, Thailand for 10 years, and I've been there more times than I can count. Um, I know the expat community is very strong and very large there. I know the cost of living there is so ridiculously low as to people won't even believe it. And I know the country, I know the culture, and it's so, so Thailand looks like an option for me. I could go live there very comfortably. I could live like a king. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I've got around is just buying an RV. Maybe I'll just sell the house, buy an RV, buy a 30 footer, and uh, just spend the rest of my life roaming around. So, where I go, what I do, I, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't decided yet. I might, I might stay here. Well, <laughs> your options are open. That's one of the things my kids told me just over the last few months, or I guess last year sometime. They said, "God, Dad, you're you're free. You work from home. You can do whatever you want and go wherever you want." And it, it was a very eye-opening moment for me, and that's how I ended up in Florida. So, if you do the RV thing, I hope you'll come see me in Florida. The night that Trinity said that she was leaving, and of course, we'd had months leading up to that moment in time. It wasn't the same situation where I, I was not blindsided, let's put it that way. Um, and I was talking to my brother and his wife. Um, it was very, very late at night, and I was talking to them, and my sister-in-law asked me a really important question, and it forced me to really think about things. So I'm going to ask you the same question. If she called you right now and said, I want to come back, no. would you take her? Okay. <laughs> so the sadness, the frustration, the, the pain that you've been through, that does not mean that you would take her back. The destruction, the wanton destruction, the wanton cruelty, the wanton greed, it's far too wide and far too deep. There's no repair for this. There's no going back to this. Yeah. Um, I'm not about to make the same mistake that I made on the day that I got married. And it's taken me 38 years to learn the lesson, but I've learned it. I'm glad to hear it. I really am. It doesn't mean but I wouldn't be gratified to hear her say, oh my God, I've had a dawning and a wake up call and I am so sorry. I can't believe oh. it would gratify me to hear that. Wouldn't change anything. Yeah. But it would gratify me to hear that. I'm, I'm, because I truly, I don't, I don't wish her I don't wish her destruction. I don't wish her. I, I, I want her to be well. Mm -hmm. Now, her grifter boyfriend, on the other hand, that's a whole nother matter. <laughs> that's a whole different thing. But that's that's another thing. But no, I I, I don't. I, I, I want to see her. I want to see her get better. I want to see her come to terms with the demons that she's carrying. Because you know what? I learned that she wasn't so much leaving me as she was running away from herself. Right. Well, my therapist heard me utter those words. She said, wow, Dave, she said, I'm so glad that you see that. Yeah. So glad that you see that because that's what she's doing. She's running away from herself. But the problem is you can't run away from yourself. You're going to bring that baggage. You're going to bring that junk with you no matter where you go. You're going to tow it around like a, like a boat anchor and it's going to, Whatever it was that caused you to feel this way in our marriage, 
you're taking it with you. Yeah. You're taking it with you. Yep. And until you come to until you come to grips with that. And if she ever does come to grips with it, that's when maybe she'll figure it out. And you know what? I don't ever want to talk to her again. I don't want to see her again. I want her excised. And I want her out of my life completely. So whatever she does or doesn't do going forward, none of my business anymore. So let's let's end this here on uh, what I consider to be the most valuable part of this podcast. I think uh, I may have told you this, but I actually get comments almost every week from different people who are happily married, and they send me notes telling me that they listen to the show and then talk to each other about how to make sure they don't end up on the show. And that's not why we started it. That wasn't what we had in mind, but the fact that there are couples out there who are taking the lessons that you and I have both learned, um, that's heartwarming to me and it's exciting. So to me, that's why this next segment here is the most important one, which is what have you learned? What advice would you share with our listeners? Communication. I could put it in one word. Communication. If you're in a marriage, whether it's healthy or unhealthy, or somewhere in between, good days, bad days, we all have brains. We all have the ability to formulate sentences. We all have the ability to say what we're thinking and to say what we're feeling. Honest communication. Don't rely on signs. Don't think your spouse is getting the message because you've done this or um, or that you've tried to convey something about how you're feeling in a very indirect way. Uh, you know, if businesses were to conduct business with other businesses in that way, <laughs> right? Um, it, it would be a total failure. And your marriage or relationship won't fail unless you're communicating with one another and communicating honestly. You know, my ex always told me that she had a hard time talking about feelings. And uh, she said, I'm just very uncomfortable with it. I said, well, you really ought to seek some counseling to get over that hump because without communicating, without communication, what do we have? Talk to each other, use your words. If you love them, tell them you love them. Mm-hmm. Give them a hug, give them a kiss, bring home flowers. If you're mad at them, tell them I'm mad at you. And here's why. Use I statements. I feel this way. Communicate. Because if you're not communicating and you're having issues, they're going to stew and they're going to fester. And, uh, then you could end up where I am. You don't want that. What a great guy. And how sad is it that that one word, communication, is such great advice? Because it's so important. And yet so many marriages fall apart because one or both parties involved try to communicate through signs or signals rather than using actual words. Dave still loves Darlene. You can hear it in his voice and see it on his face. I'm so grateful that Dave was willing to speak with me and share his story with all of us. He has a long healing journey ahead and I wish him only the best along the way. Do me a favor and go follow Dave on TikTok at Braveheart underscore 38. Like a lot of our previous guests, Dave's TikTok channel is dedicated to helping others get through their divorce. I hope you liked that story. If so, please take a few seconds to give us a five-star rating on your podcast app right now. That really helps us spread the word about the show. Have an amazing week, everyone. Bye.
It's a great day, I'm feeling good. Oh, the possibilities of what I could. Oh, do with the world at my fingertips. My imagination brings a smile up to my lips. Divorce doesn't have to be complicated. Our Divorce.com's three-step procedure provides a simple and affordable process that you can follow at your own pace. Save thousands by visiting OurDivorce.com today.